Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this public lecture, which is being hosted by the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment and the ESRC Centre for Climate Change Economics and Policy. Uh, my name is Simon Dietz, uh, and I'm one of the directors of the Institute and the Centre. And let me begin by getting the practicalities out of the way. Um, if you hear a fire alarm, please uh, follow the instructions of the stewards. They know what they're doing. I don't. Secondly, please ensure your mobile phones are on silent. Thirdly, if you wish to tweet about the event on your silenced mobile phone, then the hashtag is hash LSE Stern. And fourthly, the event is being recorded and a podcast will hopefully, and we're always instructed to say hopefully, be made available afterwards. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, you to tonight's speaker, Professor Lord Stern of Brentford, or Nick, to us. Um, Nick is the IG Patel Professor of Economics and Government, Chairman of the Grantham Research Institute, Chairman of the ESRC Centre for Climate Change Economics and Policy, and Head of the India Observatory at LSE. He's President of the British Academy and was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in June 2014. He's had a long and very distinguished career in academia and public service, including positions at a collection of the most prestigious universities in the United Kingdom, United States, France, India, and China, as well as at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, and Her Majesty's Treasury. He was knighted for services to economics in 2004 and made a crossbench life peer in 2007. He holds 12 honorary degrees, 12? Can I have one? <laughs> Nick has made significant contributions to our understanding of many issues in economics, growth and development, but tonight marks almost 10 years uh, to the day. Uh, I think it's actually at the weekend, so we'll mark it today rather than at the weekend, since the publication of the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, and I had the, the pleasure uh, of working for Nick on the review um, the review was an epic, uh, roughly 700-page analysis of the impacts of climate change, strategies to reduce carbon emissions and adapt to climate change, both within countries and in terms of countries cooperating with each other. It had an enormous impact on both the academic debate and wider public discussions and policy. Uh, according to Google Scholar, which I checked this morning, it's been cited 16,164 times by academic papers, um, and as an indication of um, the media coverage that the review had, I thought it might be kind of fun to dip into my collection of press cuttings from the few days after the review and show you a few of those now. So let's hope this works. So headline of the Observer newspaper the day before publication of the review, £3.68 trillion, pounds, the price of failing to act on climate change. At last, a map to lead us out of catastrophe, wrote Will Hutton. Nick Stern's groundbreaking report on global warming could save the planet from meltdown. Cut carbon emissions now or face economic calamity later, uh, said the Times. After this stern admonition, our world will never be the same again, wrote David Aronovich, also in the Times. Saving the planet can also benefit British business, writes Damien Rees in The Telegraph, and last but not least, I'm saving the world you lot are paying <laughs> in the sun. So, uh, let me now invite Nick to the lectern, lectern to deliver his lecture on growth and sustainability 10 years on from the Stern Review. There'll be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, so I'd ask you to keep your questions until then. So, Nick, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. I, I, I wasn't aware until just a mo few moments ago that the, um, some of the press was coming, and then I was a bit worried because the Sun uh, on page three, uh, and you didn't include this, had, I think her name was Keeley, <laughs> and, um, and she had ten green tips, uh, and I was on the page... Um, Next to it, page two, holding a copy of the Stern Review over my chest, 
And I, I, I'm not going to describe Keely, but she was not holding a copy of the... <laughs> uh, but thank you for not including uh, that one. That's, that's quite all right. One of the green tips was save money and share with a friend. Uh, I, 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 um, and thereby, of course, reduce emissions and the energy and all that. But I can see... Um, so thank you for avoiding that one. I hadn't prepared that remark. It was because of what you did. But the, um, I just wanted to check. I can see a number of my dear friends from the Stern Review in the audience. Uh, could you raise your hands? You? <laughs> well, that's five of you. Well, that's not bad. It's half term is the problem, so we've lost a few. Uh, they, were, they were productive young people, so we've lost a few uh, along the way because of half term. But thank you all very much for, for what you did, and Sean Peters, Commander Peters, led the team that uh, uh, was working on that. And, and thank you, Simon, personally, for all the work you, you put into this. Now, um, what I want to try to do is to see where we've come in the last 10 years. Tomorrow I'll be giving a talk at the Royal Society where we will be um, looking ahead at what we do in the next 10 years. Uh, but today I'm look, mostly looking back. What have we learnt in those uh, last 10 years? Now, I think we've come a long way. Um, the, uh, who would have thought 10 years ago that most of the major car makers would be making uh, electric cars or hybrids, who would have thought that the cost of uh, a solar panel had come down by a factor of, would have come down by a factor of uh, 15 or 20, and who would have thought that the climate change agreement will come into force next week, just about 10 years on from the Stern Review. November the 4th, uh, the COP21 uh, comes into force. And I do see Laurence. Laurence, you're gonna stand up, come on. Laurence Tubiano put the COP21 together. So, but we've gone, clearly we've gone too slowly, and a big part of my argument tonight will be, although we've learnt a lot, come a long way, it's been much too slow, and we're going to have to accelerate, and I hope tomorrow, to try to set out how we uh, have to accelerate. So, but that's the story tomorrow. This will be 10 years, mostly looking back about what we uh, have learnt. Now, is this going to work? Is it going to work? I used the keyboard to just yeah, I the keyboard. There. Old, old style. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's going backwards. Oh, is it? Okay. Here we are. Here we are. So this is the story. So let's begin, and I'll go, I'll go fairly fast because there's lots to cover, and I'll use a broad brush, but uh, we can pick up on details. Um, but a lot's happened in the last 10 years. So how did this all start? Well, I was asked to do it, I think, because um, I... I was a policy wonk. I mean, I, I did public policy and economic development all my uh, adult life, starting in the late 60s. So the idea was to look at um, the story from the point of view of public policy. So um, I came from um, to the Treasury in uh, 2003, having spent the previous 10 years as chief economist of the EBRD and of the World Bank. Um, in, uh, in the first year, we did all sorts of things, like putting revenue and customs uh, together, and, and I, wrote a, I wrote a report on uh, tax reform, which got buried in a drawer because it wasn't quite the thing. But the, um, th what I did do is write the report for the Commission for Africa in the lead-up to the G8 summit, um, with another very good team, I should say. And uh, at the G8 summit in Glen Eagles in 2005, there were two subjects, Africa and climate change. Africa was well understood. There was a commitment to double aid to Africa in the next uh, uh, five years or so, and people engaged. Uh, their eyes glazed over on climate change. The, um, you'll remember that, uh, Siobhan, that when the subject was proposed, the Sherpas couldn't understand why they were bothering with such a marginal thing as climate change. The only two people who understood it uh, in some degree were Tony Blair and Jack Chirac, and that was a moment where they didn't like each other very much. And uh, so it didn't get very far. But we reviewed it afterwards. Why didn't it get very far? Well, one of the reasons it didn't get very far was that the economics of it was not shared. 
that the magnitude of the risks were not understood. That's the science. But particularly, the economics wasn't well enough understood. And so uh, Gordon Brown and I discussed that, and we said, right, that's what, uh, that's what we need. And maybe it wasn't looking for another report on tax reform. So we'll do a report on the economics of climate change. And uh, we retrofitted, with good grace, Tony Blair the next day, because that was sort of Tony's subject. Um, but uh, they were both extremely supportive of this story. And one year later, when, or 15 months later, we assembled the team and then we took about a year to do this. Um, they walked down from Downing Street together, not quite arm in arm, but side by side. And uh, we launched it at the Royal Society. So that was the uh, chronology. It was uh, published by Cambridge University Press in January 2007, but it came out online um, uh, in uh, October, end of October 2016. Now, as um, Simon said, it has 700 pages. There are some people who've read it all, um, but it had 27 chapters. Some chapters got more attention than uh, others. Uh, had 27 chapters. These were the six, roughly the structure of the report is what I've got up here. Starts with the basic inputs to an analysis of this kind, the science, the economic principles, and the ethics, and we stress the ethics. You can't think about this subject with its enormous potential uh, changes involved which affect people's lives and affect people's ability to live in uh, crucial ways without bringing in the ethics. We looked at the modeling of impacts and, uh, well, we looked at the analysis and then the modeling of uh, impacts. We looked at policies in terms of the kinds of things economists usually talk about, prices, taxes, regulations. We tried to examine the costs. We looked at uh, adaptation. And finally, of course, because this is very much a public uh, uh, good in the sense that the atmosphere can't tell and doesn't care whether a kilogram of a greenhouse gas uh, came from uh, Johannesburg, London, San Francisco, or Beijing. You have to, this, uh, it's a public good or a public bad, if you like. You have to look at this in terms of international collaboration. What were the key messages? Well, we're all going to be affected by this, and the exchange and the scale is potentially very large. The costs of action are far less than the costs of inaction. Delay is deeply dangerous. I'll be coming and looking at these and seeing how they've survived. Uh, climate change is the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. Good policy can give strong results, and collaboration across the world is fundamental. Those are the big conclusions, and I think that actually they've stood the test of time. Indeed, I would strengthen virtually all of those uh, conclusions. So that's the history. That's what we said. So how have our ideas and our understanding moved on since then. Well, the science is still more robust and clear. I have to say it was pretty clear when we did the uh, Stern Review, but it's still more robust because you've got another decade of research. But this basic phenomenon began to be understood by Fourier 200 years ago, and uh, the depth of the analysis has increased, and the evidence has uh, got stronger and stronger throughout that 200 years, including and particularly in the last 10 years. So uh, science is uh, still stronger, and it looks still more worrying in terms of the potential effects. Um, the emissions have gone on rising. And of course, whilst uh, net emissions are positive, the concentrations go on rising. So c concentrations have been rising pretty rapidly. So the problem has been getting more difficult for that reason. So both from the point of view of what the science is telling us and from the fact that concentrations have rise, been rising rapidly, it's still more worrying. And because it's, the science has become still more worrying, the kinds of ranges for target uh, concentrations that we floated in the Stern Review, in retrospect, look too high. And so um, we, we, we suggested 500 parts per million or so, a bit more, as a possible target. And I think now we would have to say that our understanding of the dangers are such that uh, uh, we should have been more uh, strong in terms of the kinds of actions and targets that we should have been going for. So if you do not very much and you go on adding two and a half parts per million a year of uh, CO2 equivalent and you run that forward for 100 years or so, bearing in mind that that would go on increasing if you didn't change your ways, you're really talking about over 100 years or so, 
um, inaction or business as usual, whatever you call it, uh, you'd be talking over 100 years or so of something like 850 parts per million, which would be deeply, deeply dangerous. I mean, it would be the end of the world as we know it, four or five degrees centigrade. We haven't been there for tens of millions of years. And uh, presumably through inundation, desertification in different parts of the world, extreme weather events becoming ever more hostile, sea level rise, you'd essentially get hundreds of millions, probably billions of people on the move. So the scale from inaction of the uh, risks is immense. We are um, the kind of scale I've spoken about, as I said, four or five degrees centigrade. We haven't seen that for tens of millions of years. And it goes, of course, it's not simply looking and a narrow way at the concentrations and the temperatures, what you could do is set in, uh, set in play uh, really unstable dynamics where you have uh, tipping points and irreversibilities, uh, loss of sea ice, land ice melt. If the land ice melts, then that slides into the sea and you get rapid sea level rise. As you notice when you get in your bath, the uh, level of bath water goes up. That's Archimedes spotted that. And if the uh, land ice melt slides off, uh, that could be quite rapid sea level rise. Um, thawing of permafrost, dieback of the Amazon. You can see all kinds of tipping points, as uh, is often called, or unstable dynamics that could be the result of all this. So it's, the path we're on is deeply, deeply dangerous. And I think with retrospect, it looks still more dangerous than we, suggest, we suggested. The, of course, there's lots and lots of uncertainty in here. Um, we don't know exactly how fast emissions will rise. Uh, with concentrations, we don't know exactly how much temperature will increase. Um, with temperature increase, we don't know exactly what kind of climate effects there'll be. Climate effects, we don't know exactly what kind of effect they will have or impact they will have on human lives. Uh, we can say that the risks look extremely large, and we can talk about the possibilities and the distributions, probability distributions, and so on. But we can't say exactly what will happen. Uh, but we can say the dangers are immense. If the dangers are immense, you'd better react to it. But sometimes, with uncertainty, and you don't know what's going to happen, it does make sense to wait and see. This is not an example like that precisely because the ratchet effect of uh, flows of emissions into concentrations. In economic, e economics, we call it flow stock issue. So uh, all the while you wait, the stock goes up, the concentrations goes up, it gets more and more difficult. And the second reason is the lock-in of infrastructure. The longer you wait, the more you build dirty infrastructure. That lasts for 30, 40, 50 years, and it uh, is very costly or difficult or politically impossible to uh, scrap. And all this in a period of very rapid urbanization, which I'll come back to, and very big building of infrastructure. I mean, very crudely speaking, let me anticipate, a 3% or so growth rate over the next 20 years or so means roughly a doubling of world output. That would, so you're adding another world in terms of economics and emissions over uh, 20 years or so, roughly 3% growth rate, which may, may not be far off. Uh, it'll be more than that with infrastructure, more than that, because a lot of countries are moving through periods of rapid urbanization and through um, uh, uh, income levels where the income elasticity of demand for energy transport and so on is quite high. So this doubling of the world economy in 20 years will be a lot more than doubling of infrastructure at that time. You get that wrong, or we get that wrong in the next 20 years, we are finished with uh, any chance of two degrees, and we are build, we'll, we'll have built ourselves cities where you can't move or breathe or be productive. Well, cities where you can't move or breathe or be productive because of the nature of the infrastructure sounds like a very bad idea. Locking yourself into way beyond two degrees sounds like a very bad idea. So delay is very dangerous, and that's, uh, I think that the view that we, we did say delay would be very dangerous in the Stern Review, that again is something I think that should be very strongly uh, ramped up in terms of the message. So I think virtually all the messages there are stronger now, should I say even stronger now, than they were then. We've started to look more closely at what's involved in holding to two degrees. And uh, there's a, I can see 
my friend and great climate scholar Brian Hoskins in, in the audience, and he and his colleagues have recently published a very nice paper um, about, now I'm putting it much more crudely than they did, uh, because they're subtle and scientists, but um, essentially, all the while that concentrations go up, warming goes up. You do not stabilize temperature, even if, God forbid, it's at five degrees centigrade. You do not stabilize temperature unless you've stabilized concentrations. Stabilized concentrations, crudely speaking, is net zero emissions, or in the Paris language, sources and sinks balance. So you've got to go, unless temperature goes up forever, you've got to, um, if you're going to stabilize concentrations, therefore stabilize temperatures, you've got to go to um, uh, net zero emissions. Um, so the temperature you choose determines the date at which, or in large measure, determines the date at which you're aiming for zero emissions, net emissions. Probably for well below two degrees, again, some uncertainty. We might be talking about 2070, 2080 for net zero emissions. Surely before the end of the century for net zero emissions, probably a good deal earlier than that to hold at well below two degrees. So we've got to be thinking now of the world of net zero emissions, and uh, that's a very important part of the story. And I think it's a a topic that's come much more, I mean, the logic I gave just now is inexorable and was there before, but I think it's become much more prominent now in our discussions. Well, what uh, were the Paris pledges? Well, they were differently framed in different countries, and some of them, for example, China and India, were in terms of emissions per unit of output. Others were in terms of absolute emissions and, and so on. But if you look at this, and a number of us, um, it'd be like, these calculations started with Chris Taylor, who's already also here. Uh, we started calculating um, what the emission totals of the different kinds of promises really add up to. And you have to add them up because this is a public good or a public bad. It looks like the Paris pledges are for around 55 um, gigaton CO2 equivalent per annum in 2030, which was the year for which the intended nationally determined contributions were offered. That's a good deal better than some notion of business as usual, which would probably have been at least 10 um, gigaton CO2 equivalent higher than that. But what you really need to be talking about for something like two degrees is 40 gigatons or less. Of course, the number in any one year depends on what you assume for the years that come after that. But making reasonable assumptions for the years that come after that you should really be around 40 gigatons or less um, uh, in 2030. So essentially, Paris was talking, because we're about 50 now, gigaton CO2 equivalent, and a giga is for the scientists. Economists do billions, but they're the same thing. Um, uh, essentially, Paris is sort of looking at, with all the pledges that were coming in or intended contributions coming in, Paris is looking about a 10% increase, where actually we need a 20% decrease for a two degree path. So we're very much off track uh, for the well below two degrees. But uh, Paris, and I'll come say a bit more in a minute, but Paris was very honest about that in the sense that um, it recognized that gap between the declared temperature goal and the emissions. And of course, a big part of the story is how do you work to ramp up those emissions. Now, one thing that's, um, as I've already said, that the, the Stern Review essentially under, underestimated the risks and costs of inaction, and I've also emphasized um, that right at the beginning, that we're seeing rapid technical progress, quite remarkable technical progress, really, and that m moves to decrease the cost of action. So from the point of view of technical progress, costs of action have decreased. From the point of view of the science and the delay, the costs of inaction have increased. So the statement that the costs of inaction are much bigger than the costs of uh, action is, is still stronger. We have to qualify that around the costs of action because I think we need to tighten the uh, targets and, of course, delay in action means you have to act more strongly. But there's a, a deeper thing that I want to draw attention to here is that I think the language now of costs of action is misplaced. It's become misplaced to the very best of reasons, that we've made progress and we've seen how to do things differently. For me now, the story is one, is how do we generate the investments to take advantage of this new sustainable growth, growth story, which is so more, much more attractive 
than the growth story we've experienced up to now. So the way I phrase it now is this is a story of realizing these enormous benefits from a different way of doing things, and how do we incentivize and organize and finance the investments that are necessary to make that happen. So instead of speaking about the cost of action, I would speak more now about uh, how do we uh, foster and um, put in place this very exciting story of growth. Here you are, that's a little picture of um, the price history of, uh, you can do it now, you can buy them now for ballpark uh, 30 uh, cents a watt, whereas 40 years ago you were talking about $76 a watt, and at the time of the Stern Review, five or six dollars a watt. That's come down by a factor of 20. Now you still have to pay somebody to stick it on your roof and so on, that's not quite the uh, cost of getting your electricity, but you can see it's an absolutely dramatic uh, story. And that's without much technical progress. It's still basically the same sort of thing. What's happened, of course, is very big economies of scale and uh, lots of good old engineering learning by doing. But the big technical progress side is still to come, and there's quite a lot in the pipeline uh, on doing uh, solar PV differently. But there's lots more. I mean, that's just one example with big progress in wind, starting to make big projects in storage. But you must always remember that electricity is probably only, depends which country you look at, 18, 19, 20, 25% of emissions. People jump straight to the power sector and say it's all about the power sector. Well, it's a lot about the power sector, but it's not all about the power sector. Industry, uh, heating, transport, and so on are the big majority of emissions, somewhere between four-fifths and three-quarters, depending on what country you look at. My great friend Montek, I keep seeing all my friends in the audience, uh, my great friend Montek Singh Aluwali and I, with um, Himanshu Gupta, recently published a paper looking at where the big reductions in India would come. And there are plenty of reductions available in the power sector, but by far the biggest reductions are outside the power sector, and a very big part of that in energy efficiency. Again, about which we've learnt uh, a great deal over the years. Josue's not here, is he? No, I don't see Josue. Josue Tanaka leads on uh, clean energy and energy efficiency for the EBRD, and they've been doing amazing investments uh, over the years, and that's a very big part of the story. So I've picked this out because it's, it's dramatic and it matters, but there's lots more of um, innovation going on and uh, cost reductions in different parts of the story. So I think I've argued, and I would argue, that this is the growth story of the uh, future. We try to argue that in better growth, better climate, uh, which is the new climate economy, the Global Commission on Economy and Climate, which I co-chair with Felipe Calderon, the former president of Mexico. We published that two years ago, um, ahead of, a year or so, ahead of, deliberately of course, ahead of Paris. And I think it helped move the discussion on from who bears the burden to how do we realize these much better growth prospects that uh, we have. I'm sure that quite a few of you in the audience are proud possessors of the copy of copies Why Are We Waiting, which I published with MIT Press last year. If you brought it with you, I'm happy to sign it uh, afterwards. But you can see also there an articulation of the way in which uh, our thoughts have developed. And very recently, the Global Commission on Economy and Climate published uh, its latest report, the uh, Sustainable Imp Infrastructure Imperative, which was built on a paper which um, Amar Bhattacharya and myself and other, and uh, is Jeremy here? Uh, he'll be there tomorrow, uh, co-author of, um, of that. So basically, I would argue, we would argue, that if you want to boost growth in the short or medium term, invest in infrastructure. You better make it sustainable because that's the growth story of the future. That's what uh, we say, that's what the OECD says, that's what the IMF says, and we're all right. The, um, it, 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 we've, we've run out of road on monetary policy. I mean, the bankers have done, the, 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 bank, the bank governors, central bank governors have done remarkably well in trying to keep growth or go, going or recession away through monetary policy, but we've run out of road on, on that. If you really want to get growth, and 
the people who've got the fiscal space don't want to use it. So you've got really a story of growth which is very attractive and right here over the short to medium term. In the medium term, this is all about uh, innovation and creativity uh, through what we're already discovering, but which will happen much faster. It, it, it's a classic Schumpeterian um, uh, story of waves of technological change. That's the medium term story. And of course, it's the only long run growth path on offer. Any attempt to run a long run growth path on high carbon self-destructs uh, through the very hostile environment that it creates. So this is the growth story, and it's a very attractive one. So I, I'm not one of those who wants to um, stop growth and you know grow a beard and all that. Um, and I, I don't mind beards really, but the uh, <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't have to be sort of uh, hair shirts, hair shirts and abstinence. It's about doing things differently, doing things very differently, and we can see how to do that. And that will give us powerful growth over the next 20, 30, 50 years, which is critical for poverty reduction around the world. Will it go on forever? I mean, I haven't a clue. Probably not. But forever's a long time. I always remember Woody Allen that uh, eternity is a long time, particularly near the end. And I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not talking here about indefinite growth, but I am talking here about a growth story over the next half century that gives us a chance to tackle that other great challenge of this century, which is overcoming world poverty. So that's the story. What's on offer is a chance to reduce uh, poverty drastically. These stories are much more inclusive than other forms of growth. And you can't do public transport other than in a community. You can't reuse and recycle other than in a uh, community. Um, the efficient to broad uh, water supplies and sustainable water supplies, uh, liberate women from all sorts of dangers and uh, labor, decentralize solar, allow kids to study at night. This is a story which is much more inclusive as well of, and reducing of poverty on all its uh, dimensions. And of course, ecosystems that are productive and resilient as well. I mean, it is an enormously attractive proposition, so the challenge is how we actually do it. Now, i would be very quick on the beginnings of action because we want to leave some time for discussion. But there's all sorts of stuff going on and has gone on over these last 10 years. You've got 40 national jurisdictions and 20 cities or states, regions, putting a price on carbon. China are about to launch a big one uh, nationwide now. It's been looking at, it's been in basically seven provinces up to now, but launching a big uh, national uh, 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 emissions trading scheme uh, next year. The development banks are very strong on the, this now. I've already mentioned the EBRD, which is an outstanding example, but the World Bank, uh, the IMF is not a development uh, bank, but it is a, an international financial institution. The Financial Stability um, Bureau under Mark Carney, which is the uh, formed within or around the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central banker's central bank. They're looking very closely at the instabilities associated with uh, climate change. The new banks that have been founded, I was very much involved with Amar Bhattacharya and Joe Stiglitz in helping launch the new development bank, the BRICS Bank, and their first projects were entirely renewable energy. I'm on, for transparency, I'm on the International Advisory Panel of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, and they have insisted that they're clean and green uh, from the beginning. And we've got the green, we've got the Green Climate Fund now uh, in existence too. So we're seeing lots of nations, lots of cities, lots of uh, uh, development banks. But and this is something I'll be emphasising particularly strongly in my talk tomorrow. It's very important for infrastructure investment to take place that credibility is there, that there's a clear picture of where the economy is going, otherwise infrastructure invest investors are not ready to take the risks because these are big commitments that last for a long time. Um, Government-induced policy risk is the biggest killer from investment for investment, whether it's green, purple, or some other color. And so stability in the policy framework, and you can build institutions that make that uh, more likely. Certainty is not on offer, but reduced uncertainty can be 
on offer with uh, good institutional structures. Uh, cities worldwide, I won't go into much detail here. These slides will all be available, and it's, they're written a bit like a, a paper without all the punctuation, so um, I hope that the stories I'm telling will be understandable for those of you who want to have another look afterwards, and uh, the, slides, the slides are a public good, so they'll be uh, available. So um, very big, uh, uh, very big movement across the cities, and the wonderful Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, uh, who was a big leader around uh, the time of the um, Paris uh, discussions in December last uh, last year. Private firms, uh, financial and otherwise, are often well. Are many of them are moving very strongly and. They often have longer time horizons than governments, and uh, they understand that if you're responsible, uh, you're much likely to be well regarded. People want the best people want to work for you, um, and uh, people I think think if you're responsible on one dimension, you're much more likely to be responsible on another dimension. So, pension fund, the Swedish National Pension Fund, AP4, run by the wonderful Mats Andersson up to a year or so ago. Uh, has, uh, I won't go in, into the details, but essentially they look at, they're very big, so they look at all their things they own in a particular sector, and they rank those things that they, I mean, it might be airlines, it might be uh, re retail or whatever, they look at a particular sector and they ask, which is the least responsible of the companies in which we have shares? They sell that one and they say, why? And because it has a very powerful uh, impact on incentives, much more powerful than saying, you're an oil company, I don't like you. Um, this one is a much more targeted way of giving incentives for disinvestment. So uh, if people ask me, am I favoring disinvestment, I say, yes, I am. I'm in favor of what AP4 uh, does uh, on, uh, on, on this. Uh, other pension funds have moved very strongly. Unile Unilever, and I, I believe they uh, will do it, will be carbon positive by uh, 2030, in other words, uh, negative net emissions. Paul Polman, the chief executive, will be coming to talk to our session at the Royal Society uh, tomorrow, IKEA and also. And, and a very large number of companies have internal carbon prices. And it makes sense for them to do that because they're looking for the long term, they're locking themselves into stories. Uh, locking themselves into ways of investing, ways of organizing themselves over quite a long period of time. And if the world is moving in the good direction, and with fits and starts it is, too slowly, but it is moving in that uh, direction, then it's wise to do it, but it's also responsible. That which is responsible is also that which is wise and that which is profitable. And more and more companies are uh, understanding that. Our own country, uh, the uh, UK, we are, of course, citizens of the UK and citizens of the world, and um, find it very comfortable to be both. And the, uh, essentially, we led the way with domestic action. Uh, the Climate Change Act came in in 2008, uh, just uh, a year and a bit after the, uh, well, nearly two years after the review was uh, Published. And it's a landmark piece of legislation. It gives a sense of direction, and it holds the government to account. Uh, but it's a it's a uh, institution of the uh, UK, and it gives some increase in credibility. And there's more than one member of the Climate Change Committee here. They it gives uh, some credibility on uh, the sense of direction. The UK was very good in Paris in leading the high ambition, in the high ambition group looking for a strong agreement. Amber Rudd, uh, then the minister, now the Home Secretary, and the wonderful Pete Betts, and is Pete here? Who uh, led the negotiations, uh, is a civil servant now in BEIS, was in DEC, led the negotiations for uh, not only the UK, well actually the EU was negotiating as a group and Pete uh, led that. So the UK has had a good run. I mean, it's um, reduced emissions by 60% since 1990, while the economy has grown by nearly 40%. It's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad record. But um, last year, there were wobbles and question marks, and I'm trusting that this year it will be a reaffirmation and a less wobbly approach to policy. 
I do have confidence in uh, Greg Clark, who's uh, the Secretary of State for BEIS. He understands this extremely well, been very much involved in this whole story for a very long uh, time. So let's hope it works. We have an industrial strategy coming in the UK, and uh, some of us are working quite hard to uh, encourage that industrial, and that's under Greg Clark in BEIS, to make that industrial strategy obviously a low carbon industrial strategy. It makes no sense otherwise. Of course, the biggest thing in the world is China. And uh, China's commitment over these last years has been absolutely remarkable. I've been working in China now for nearly 20 years. And uh, actually, no, sorry, um, nearly, 30, nearly 30 years I've been working in uh, and living in some parts in China. I've been living in India for more than 40, and working in India for more than 40 years. Um, China's change in the last six or seven years has been quite remarkable. And they peaked coal about two years ago. And um, it'll probably be flat for a bit. Uh, Fergus Green and I have papers. Fergus here. Uh, have a paper on that, looking at the pattern of growth. And uh, other people's OG, here, I see, is here from China. There's a, a there's a, a it, it's been a change which is quite remarkable. And it happens for reasons which are very real and lasting. Those reasons are China is uh, a country that looks ahead has long time horizons, and has lots of engineers in the uh, Politburo. They think about the future, they think about water, and uh, they worry, and they worry for good reason, because climate change is about water, or it's <coughs> disruption in uh, large measure. And for millennia, China's had difficult issues around uh, water. The pollution in China is deeply worrying in the cities, and some of the most senior economic policy makers, and senior party officials, senior ministers will tell you what's the point of all this uh, development um, if our cities are unlivable. And that is a real strong and deeply political uh, issue in uh, China. Uh, and of course, China realizes that China is big. It's a funny thing to say, but China now knows and understands and acts on the fact that it's very big, which means not only that what it does is a very, by far the biggest emitter, not only what it does has a very big effect on climate, but what it does has a very big effect on what other people do. China's big in that sense, and China's very clear on uh, that. And also, China is um, pretty good at making some of these relevant things, and it rather fancies itself as doing well in the green race, and good luck to China in the green race is, uh, is my view. So I, this is a, I've got five minutes for the nerds here. Um, how many of you are economists? <coughs> Maybe five, ten, not more, it's actually less than 10%, isn't it? Well, it's your fault, you could have been. Uh, well, <laughs> at least some of you have the talents which mean you could have been. Um, so, but there's a little bit of uh, sort of more, more technical <coughs> economics uh, here. Um, by the way, I, 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 I know of no analytical errors of substance in 700 pages. I've spotted four or five typos. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't gone back through the whole thing, but uh, essentially, but what we did have some challenge on some of our perspectives, and I'll, I'll speak to those. Um, one perspective was that we'd overcooked the scale of the risk and the damages. Well, that attack was completely wrong. And in fact, as I've argued already, we underestimated the uh, potential scale of the uh, damages and risks. Another line of attack was around discounting. And I was really quite shocked as somebody who worked on discounting for much of his life to realize the sort of pervasive ignorance of what the subject was really about, and I'll come back to that. Uh, two big mistakes, I, I, there, was more than, there were more than two big mistakes, but two very big mistakes in that uh, discussion, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to it, but were essentially a failure to recognize that the weight that you put on a future outcome depends enormously on how well off you think the world's gonna be there at that time. If you think, or if there's a big risk that, the world will be much worse off as a result of our negligence 50 or 100 years from now. You should be putting a, the most ethical positions, and the ethic, ethics have to be addressed directly, most ethical positions you'd be putting a higher weight 
on that outcome. And so there was a kind of idea that it, the discount rate was whatever it was, and it went on uh, forever like that, which is just ignorant about the basic logic of uh, discounting. And uh, a related mistake was that somehow you could read off the ethical discount rates from the rates of return you saw in markets, but I'll come to that. There's also issues around the integrated assessment models. Um, they, I think, began in a way which was quite useful in trying to put structures together that helped you understand the problem. So an integrated assessment model is where you put the story of how emissions come about into the same model as what the effects of those emissions could be, and you also build into the model some idea of what it costs to reduce emissions. That makes sense. And the initial discussions, and Bill Nordhaus, a scholar and a gentleman, a fine economist, began those uh, really, what, 25 years ago now. And um, so that, that they started off, I think, with quite a useful structuring of some of the issues, and I think they still have some role as structuring some of the issues. The problem was that the, in, the integrated assessment models that were built, and they grossly under, underestimated the nature and scale of risks. I can't go into it in any detail. But essentially, they work by having a multiplicative factor on GDP. So you look at uh, what GDP might be in a year in some imagined world without much global warming or climate change, and you adjust it a little bit downwards because you realize that the temperature will go up. That will make life more difficult, so you'll lose some GDP in the process. Notice in that modeling that there is no effect on the underlying growth rate, and there is no destruction of capital. And that is a serious worry about processes where capital could be destroyed on a big scale and the whole structure of production could be undermined. So they're difficult in the way they've set up their models, but particularly they grossly underestimate any reasonable notion of damages. Um, in one of uh, Bill Nordhaus's models, and there are other people who use much weaker damage du functions than Bill, and Bill has been ramping up his story of damage, uh, there was a 50% loss of GDP from an 18 degree increase. So you lose half your GDP. You would have been dead, burnt dead, um, you know, smashed up dead, way, way before probably seven or eight degrees, let alone 18 degrees. And uh, uh, of course, correspondingly uh, absurdly low damages at temperatures of three, four, five degrees where percentage losses of GDP at three, four, five, six degrees were just a few percent of GDP. It just didn't make any sense in relation to the science. You know, and scientists would just sort of clean their glasses and wonder what was going on when they would look at these kinds of modeling. Um, Simon and I published last year in the Economic Journal for the 25th anniversary of Bill Nordhaus's original paper, a paper which showed that actually if you build in more reasonable damages and if you build in strong convexity, in other words, very sharply rising damages as you start moving in three, four, five, six degrees, you really do change those, uh, those pictures. So, but basically the kinds of models that were built and then reviewed and then deemed to be a kind of literature uh, grossly underestimated damages and they grossly overestimated the cost of action because they had little or no learning and little or no economies uh, of scale and very small uh, costs attached to so-called co-benefits. Well, the UK kills 30,000 a year from air pollution, one in 2,000. If you take the average value of statistical life at 100 times GDP per capita, then multiply the value of uh, statistical life, 100 times GDP per capita, by the 1 over 2,000, which is the fraction that you lose each year, and it's a one-liner. You can do it on the back of your envelope. That's the fraction of GDP you lose each year. That gives you, what, um, 100 times GDP per capita, 100 divided by 2,000, 1 over 2,000, 2,000, 1 over 2,000 killed every year, 100 over 2,000 is 5%. That's UK. China is probably over 10%. Um, now, you can fuss about what's this value of statistical life, and to be honest, I'm a little uncomfortable about those kinds of things, but uh, you really ought to be putting in the center of your argument that uh, 
burning fossil fuels kills people now on a very big scale around the world. Millions a year. You can argue how many millions a year, but millions a year. And as the WHO showed, it's become a real primary cause of death uh, around the world. Well, we charmingly call the reduction of that a co-benefit of uh, action. And that is something, it seems to me, to be enormously important. And it's something we've understood much better in the last five years. Why? Because the data have come in much more strongly on how much emissions there are, where, and also the um, understanding from the medics of what the consequences are. The smaller the stuff, the worse it, worse it is. Uh, it, 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 the smaller the stuff, the less likely your nostrils and tonsils are to stop it, and uh, the deeper it gets in uh, into your lungs and uh, system. This is deeply serious stuff, and that's a big part of our learning over the last few years. So, um, basically, you know, we have to be very careful as academics about shoehorning problems into the models that we have. If you talk about intertemporal allocations, oh, we'll have a growth model. Well, I did that. My thesis was about optimal growth. It was also about T, but it was uh, about optimal growth as, as well. And um, this is not a story that shoehorns easily into a growth model because we're talking about processes which will undermine the whole process uh, of growth. If we think of something being difficult or causing damage, let's consider a perturbation. Let's not make it too difficult. Let's keep it a modest or marginal perturbation. So it's the old story of somebody, somebody with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if you've got uh, growth models and you, of a standard kind and you've got marginal methods of standard kinds, then you, you use them. Now, they're, they're jolly good for some things. I use them. But um, we use some of it in the Stern Review. But you've got to be very careful about how you use them and the weight that you attach to them. And you also ought to open up other ways of looking at things, and I think that's what we've done. I think the same kind of remarks apply to marginal abatement cost curves. They started off being very useful but they are not so useful in a much more dynamic and uh, systemic analys analysis of, uh, of major change. The ethics story, well, I've already raised it, and I've already actually said the main, thing, uh, the main things. If you are looking at how much value to attach to a unit of output coming in the future, you have to ask, where will we be in that future? Or with uncertainty, where might we be in that future? And if you might be, indeed, likely to be much worse off if you don't manage climate change properly. You should be, from most ethical positions, the ethics are explicit here, should be explicit, you should be attaching a higher weight to come what comes later. That means at some point in time you'll have negative discount rates. Now the main thing is that discount rates depend on the assumptions about where you're going to be, and that's a, f a story of fundamental importance, and it was very badly missed in, uh, that, uh, in that discussion as I've already said, that you can't read off ethical values from capital markets. Capital markets are not places where people express their ethical values. They are imperfect in uh, many kinds of ways. They're enormously variable according to how they treat uh, risk and uh, uncertainty. There's really no information there. So those, in my view, were the two very big mistakes. People thought they could find these in capital markets, badly wrong. They thought that uh, you could just whack on a discount rate, run it forever, irrespective of where you were assuming the economy was going to turn out to be. So that was a disappointing quality of discussion, in my view. But I think people have woken up a bit to uh, uh, what goes on here. There's lots of intergenerational ethics, which uh, I don't want to uh, go into uh, in any detail. Uh, I do want to point out that we shouldn't just look at the um, welfare economists' approach to consequences. I mean, basically, most of economics, as we do it, is uh, looking is, is, is consequentialist ethics. I mean, you look at, in a simple way, the consequences of actions. But there's a lot of very serious ethics that doesn't work that way. You know, Kant uh, and categorical imperatives, you know, Aristotle and virtue ethics, notions of justice and rights, don't work that way. And they're all very interesting and important. And I do in chapter six, I do had some fun with this, and, and in chapter six of Why Are We Waiting, uh, runs through the various different uh, ethical approaches to, or various difficult p 
perspectives in moral philosophy and argue that they all point very powerfully in the same direction that we ought, we ought to act strongly. But at the same time, running properly the consequential uh, structure to ethics that we usually use in uh, economics. Anyway, I, I'll try to, enough nerdy stuff. Um, so last thing of what I have to say is, uh, well, what's been happening? Well, let's start internationally and then look at other things. The agreement, 2015 was an amazing year in terms of what was agreed. We had the Financing for Development Conference in Addis, Sustainable Development Goals agreed at United Nations in September 2015, the uh, Extraordinary Paris Agreement, December the 12th, 2015. Even more extraordinary, it's coming into force on the November the 4th, next week, right? And that is quite remarkable. Um, we had the Kigali amend Amendment to the Montreal Protocol just uh, a couple of weeks ago on um, HFCs and so on. It is, you know, sometimes we, you say things keep happening uh, much slower than you think they should, and suddenly they start happening much faster than you thought they could. And that's what we've seen, I think, in uh, this last uh, year or so. It's been a sea change in ideas. It's been an understanding not only of the deep risks of climate change, where the scientists have helped us so much, but also it's been about understanding that this alternative way of doing things and growing is extremely attractive and it's feasible. And that was a big part of the Paris story. It was also that Paris was very well run by Laurence Tubiana and her, her colleagues and indeed the Peruvians the year before. It was very much influenced by the announcement on November the 5th, on the announcement in November 2014 by Barack Obama and Xi Jinping in Beijing of their intended national um, determined contributions. Uh, in other words, what they would be doing, what would they would be bringing to Paris for the agreement. And they announced that a year ahead of Paris, and that was very important. And then uh, at the G20 Hangzhou, led by China, in September this year, they announced they were going to ratify it. India announced it was going to ratify it on Gandhi's birthday, October the 2nd, and then uh, the EU announced it would ratify it on somebody's birthday uh, <laughs> a few days uh, afterwards. It was wonderful and um, it's quite remarkable when I see Ed Davey is here as, as well. That, that So many people worked on this story to, uh, to make it happen and it did happen. And we should recognize just how remarkable it was. I mean you compare it with the Bretton Woods Institutions, University Declaration of Human Rights, the formation of the UN, the beginnings of the European community. All that happened at the end of the Second World War. We had had 30 years, 30 years of two world wars and a Great Depression. You had to believe, there was blood everywhere, you had to believe that there was a more collaborative, more sensible, better way of doing things. That was looking backwards through 30 years of intensely bitter experience. Paris was looking forward and anticipating risk. In Bretton Woods, 44 countries had one very bossy one, which, because it, I mean, on the whole, it was bossing in a good direction, but it, the United States was very powerful at that uh, time. Paris, 196 countries, and of course, mercifully, not one that was, I mean, some bigger ones and more powerful ones, but not a single dominant country. It was remarkable. So many countries, no one dominant country, nobody being forced into anything, looking ahead and anticipating a problem and agreeing. It was remarkable. And... Uh, and it stayed because we've seen rat I mean, Kyoto, what took nearly eight years to uh, ratify. This took 11 months. Not ratify, ratify at the appropriate hurdle levels and then come into force took 11 months. Quite remarkable. So, you know, 2016 hasn't been all good. Um, uh, we, won't go, we won't go into details, <coughs> but uh, <laughs> 2016 hasn't been all good, but uh, we have to remember. Well, you mean, Dylan won the Nobel Prize, but the 2015 was remarkable, and the challenge now, and that's what I'll be talking about tomorrow, is to deliver on that. I won't go into the details, but uh, I've said enough to say why it happened, how it happened, and how important it is. Um, but there's a big, big challenge on delivery, as I've already remarked earlier in the lectures, 
two degrees or well below two degrees should have involved at least 20% reductions between uh, 2015 and 2030. And what we've got in the, the Paris numbers is a 10% increase in emissions in that period. That's a big gap. So the challenge of ramping up is extremely important. The, social de the, the sustainable development goals, which replaced the Millennium Development Goals, which ran out in 2015. Millennium Development Goals ran, well, the measure they were agreed around the millennium, but the measurement ran from 1990 to 2015. Sustainable Development Goals um, run up to uh, 2030. And they are 17 of them. Uh, that's quite a lot of development goals, but it's 17 of them, and they cover things that really matter. Uh, 12 explicitly mentioned climate change, environment, or sustainability. And sustainability is the word that's mentioned the most of often. And all the other five implicitly ca carry the notion of sustainability with them. The world has declared through Paris, the world has declared through the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, a very ambitious agenda. We have a global agenda for the first time since the Second World War. A global agenda which was agreed to in each of these cases by everybody, and a global agenda that applies to everybody. The Sustainable Development Goals are different from Millennium Development Goals. Millennium Development Goals are mostly about developing countries. Well, we're about developing countries, but this is about every country, and every country is involved, and every country was involved in taking those decisions. So difficult, unlikely things sometimes happen, and the challenge now is to implement and build on and take them, uh, take them uh, forward. So, I'm going to talk much more tomorrow about delivering on these development goals. I will argue that sustainable infrastructure is at the heart of the whole thing. Something like 60 plus two-thirds or more of our emissions come from infrastructure and its use. If you look ahead at this kind of big expansion that I've already spoken about, more than well over doubling infrastructure, well over doubling in the next uh, uh, 20 years, uh, you're talking about enormous opportunity uh, for change. So this is a story where infrastructure is at the heart, um, and I'll develop that a bit uh, tomorrow. Um, but 70% of that infrastructure will be in emerging markets and developing countries. Well, if nearly 70% of, of these emissions are associated with infrastructure, and if around 70% of the increase in infrastructure will be in emerging market and developing countries, well, you can all multiply 0.7 by 0.7. That's pretty close to a half. So you can see half this story is in infrastructure and emerging markets and developing countries. It has to be the right way to begin the analysis of the economics and uh, what you have to do. Uh, remember that uh, technical progress is faster than we, arguably faster than, I think, no, I would argue, it's faster than we have ever seen. The digital story has only just begun. Uh, enormous change in possibilities in materials, the kind of materials that can insulate and store and do things uh, differently. Biotech has changed dramatically as well. It, it's extraordinary how fast it's moving, and those three elements, and it doesn't exhaust it, those three elements interweave and reinforce e each other. And of course, we've got the international agreements that I was just celebrating, which give some sense of uh, direction. So here it is. We've got um, a current development path which is deeply dangerous and in terms of climate and very unattractive in terms of the kinds of congested and polluted cities it creates. But we've got this other development path that we can see that's enormously attractive. The whole story of mitigation, adaptation, development are enormously intertwined. We do all these things at the same time if we uh, do this well. But we've got to do it quickly. This is a story of very rapid urbanization and very rapid infrastructure build. Just think of the urbanization story. We're about 50% now of a population of 7 billion plus in the towns and the cities and urban areas. Ballpark, 3.5 billion. Yeah? If I say 3.5 billion, the 0.5 doesn't, really doesn't matter. It's you know, plus or minus 0.3, whatever. In the middle of the century, 70 billion. In a, sorry, in the middle of the century, 70% urbanized, going up from about 50 now, to uh, in a population of nine plus billion. Well, 70%, 0.7 times nine billion plus, you're talking about six and a half billion. 
that's in about 35, 40 years. Yeah, about to stop, thank you. And um, those cities are going to be shaped in the next 20 years. Are we going to do it well or are we going to do it badly? We have an enormous responsibility. Uh, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to be around in uh, 2050 to have a look. I'll do my best. But most of, <coughs> most of you will. And it will be those decisions that will determine whether we have a cities where we can move and breathe, whether we have forests and grasslands that have some chance of uh, survival, and whether we've got any chance of holding to two degrees. It could be gone. It could be gone within 20 years, or we could have um, a very attractive and be, have moved to a very attractive growth path. Of course, the next 10 years shape the next 20. I mean, you can't suddenly do everything you have to do in the 19th year of 20 years. We're, we're about to take the decisions now, building on Paris, building on 2015, <coughs> building on the movement of cities, building on the movement of firms, building on social action. We're about to do those things which will determine the outcome what I've described. Um, we know how to begin. We know what needs to be done. We'll learn like mad along the way. I'm enormously optimistic about what can be done, but I have quite a lot of anxiety about whether it will be done. Let me stop there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, 20 to 25 minutes for questions. Um, I'll take them in groups of two or three. Um, it's, it's conventional for the chair at an LSE lecture to remind you, please, to ask a question rather than to deliver your own lecture. Um, so uh, please, anyone who would like to ask a question? Uh, we've got some roving microphones, so please just wait until we get one to you. So first, start with the gentleman. Yeah. There's also an LSE tradition of gender balance in the questions, I should say. Hello. Um, earlier you spoke about monetary policy um, running its course, uh, basically. And I just wanted to ask you if you could give us some thoughts about possibilities with fiscal policy and what we can do there. Okay, thank you. I'll take uh, another couple of questions before uh, we go to uh, back to Nick. So uh, the lady at the back there. Uh, Back row. Hi, thanks for the lecture. Um, but could you I've give us your name and where you come from? Sure, I'm Tess Osmerong and I work for Affirmative Investment Management. Um, I was really interested in what you said about um, the need for sustainable infrastructure. And I wonder about um, what your views are on green bonds and their potential to finance. And we had one more question, and Ed Davey had his hand up there. I'd like to make a comment about the, you're underplaying the role of the EU, given what's happened this year and the UK's role in that, because I think we were very important, that was a very important decision by the EU, ahead of the decision by Obama uh, and, and President Xi Jinping, um, uh, which led to pa Cecil Paris, and the fact we're no, no longer there, I think it's really bad news for the implementation of that in the, in the EU. My question, though, is about George Osborne's best economic decision, which is the appointment of Mark Carney, uh, and whether you think uh, what Mark Carney is doing at the Bank of England, uh, particularly with respect to the whole carbon track initiative, the carbon bubble and stranded assets, what that role, the role that that type of economic analysis might play in the years ahead. Thank you. Okay, so we've got three three questions to start off with, Nick. Are you happy to yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do think there's potential for fiscal policy. I think the rigidities towards fiscal policy are... Um, around the world are less than they were. I think the IMF has been very sensibly strong on that. But there are some countries like Germany where you just can't do it. Uh, so that's what I meant. Those that have the fiscal space don't want to use it. But I do think we're moving now to um, a place where it's m m a bit easier to use fiscal policy. And so my argument, part of my argument was, well, if it's a bit easier to use fiscal policy, the f there's a very big priority for investing in sustainable infrastructure, particularly where you can borrow it next to nothing, or less than nothing. Um, green bonds, I do think that they have uh, a strong role uh, to play. Uh, they have moved quite strongly. China's moved very strongly in, uh, in that area. I mean, a green bond is, crudely speaking, a bond where you promise to spend what you're borrowing on green things. 
It's not a green piece of paper or anything. I mean, they, they, and on the whole, uh, but of course, you know, you could you could finance this activity with a green bond, and actually, you know, everything's fungible and it's really being used to make battleships or something. But on the whole, I think the green bonds do work because the people who issue them are the kind of people who are reasonably transparent and then they do use them in a way that's genuinely green. I also think, because what I said about responsibility, if people want to borrow for an investment that looks like a responsible, considered, careful, long-term investment, then they might be wise, careful people and they might look after your money better than uh, other people. So I think they do have a role to play. I think I've emphasized a bit more, and it's not to put down green bonds in any way. I've mentioned a bit more in relation to infrastructure, the importance of the multilateral and the green investment banks and so on, because the difficult part of an infrastructure project is the bit at the beginning, getting it over the initial phases. And there you need people who are capable of taking risk. Uh, you, need a, you need an entity that's got a very strong shareholder structure, a long term view that can issue equity, can do mezzanine finances where you, they flip between loans and uh, equity, political risk guarantees. You need an entity that can help you through those difficult phases. Otherwise you end up paying very high real interest rates to cover for that early stage risk. Once you're through that early stage risk, then there's a whole wall of money in the institutional funds that could come in after it and would come in after it once that infrastructure project's got through its early stages and then it looks like a nice, decent, yielding project for the 30, 40, 50 years that you need to cover the pension commitments that you've made to the people who've put their money with you in the pension fund. So I think the multilateral development banks and the national development banks, the green investment banks, I hope very much that as the Green Investment Bank is privatised here in the UK, its deep underlying green uh, purpose is kept. I mean, watch, the, watch this space. Um, that will be a very important part of that story. So along with the green bonds, I emphasised also the story of the multilateral development banks, the reason I've described. Ed, I, I completely agree with you. The, uh, somehow, the, because the EU has been ahead of the game for so long, it's sort of people gave up noticing the credit and when it, it, the credit due to it and sort of when India, when China and the United States moved, they said, my goodness, isn't it good that the China and the United States had moved when the e EU had, has for a very long time been blazing this trail. I think Mark Carney's analyses of the story of um, climate risk are immensely important, extremely well done, very careful, uh, analyses of what the risks are. You know, he talks about physical risks, extreme weather events come along and knock things down. He talks about liability risks. Increasingly now, people who are polluting are being sued for the problem, and they have to start taking that into account. So all kinds of reinsurance and so on is thinking that through. But also, and this one is that some of us have, all, have ourselves stressed over the years very strongly, is stranded assets. And um, that means that as the world becomes more sensible about policies, crudely speaking, if you want a, an index for being sensible about policies, as, as, as uh, carbon prices start to rise or as regulations start to cut in to get rid of the dirty uh, stuff, then um, there will be assets which looked good under an old regime where people weren't noticing or bothering. Uh, about uh, either air pollution or, in this case, particularly uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. So things that did look good, now if you look forward, look much less good. Well, that's the whole point of policy, right? The whole point of policy is to tilt the rewards away from those things that are very damaging, to stop subsidising by allowing people to do very damaging things for nothing. That's a subsidy. So that story of policy starting to get stronger and come into place should be stranding assets. Well, in a really good system, people anticipate that and they don't go down that route and the assets are not stranded. But that's a very important part of the story. And of course, it's very big because a 
a lot of the, the fossil fuels have very big weights in our uh, stock market aggregate indices. Mark Carney's job is to look after financial stability. He said, look, here is a very big problem with financial stability. He set it out in his, what, September of last year. He set out his lecture. It was a very, I, mean, I would recommend, his, recommend that you read that lecture. It was a very carefully done. Then, as chair of the Financial Stability Bureau, of the, as I mentioned, the Bank of International Settlements, he asked Mike Bloomberg to, to uh, report back, which he will do by the end of this year, it's quite far advanced, on protocols for financial institutions to reveal the state of climate risk. I think it's going, there are quite a lot of game changers going on, but that will be one of the uh, game changers. So the financial institutions will have to look at the holdings that they have and ask how much climate risk is in those holdings and report on it. And again, we'll start uh, changing things. So I think, um, so I've spent a long time agreeing with you, Ed. All right. Um, do, uh, do we have any questions on the balcony? So we've got one down here, please. Uh, hi, I'm an uh, economic history postgraduate student here. And I was wondering, in this increasingly post-truth uh, political debate on multiple issues, and your um, frequent use of a lot of facts and expert knowledge, <laughs> what is your answer to the, well, irrational responses still given to most of the climate, well, the other side of the climate change debate, and how would you convince, especially, for example, a certain part of the American Congress to agree with your views? Okay, I've got two more questions on the balcony. First, uh, the, the lady at the front there, and then I'll, I'll come over to you in a moment, okay? Um, hi, my name is Shalu. I'm a student at UCL, and I'm from India. And my question is that uh, one of the major hurdles to investment currently, like in the sustainable infrastructure is a high expected rate of interest uh, and the returns, basically. Uh, so what role do you think can the carbon pricing play in sending the right signals to the market? And do you think that we are close to the point where like, this mechanism could be implemented globally? Okay. Thank you very much. And now one more question here at the front. Yes. Yes, we've got a microphone there for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you consider that population growth is uh, something to be really concerned about? Thank you. So there we go, three questions. Thanks very much for post-truth. Um, I suppose we have this uh, understandable belief that rational argument is better than irrational argument. Um, I think it's a good idea to stick with that. Um, <laughs> but I do think that we're not, we have to get better at capturing quickly. I mean, this. I mean, think of, um, well, I'll take a risk here. I mean, think, think of Donald Trump's campaign. <laughs> Do you like Mexicans, brackets, brown, taking your jobs? Do you like Chinese, brackets, yellow, changing your markets? And you, do you like Arabs trying to kill you? I rest my case. 10 seconds. Yeah? And populism, when the ground is fertile, is, can be done very fast and very slickly, and is done. I, I won't comment on the Brexit discussion. The, um, this is difficult. Um, we have to get, as these sort of nice academic, seemingly rational, possibly informed people, we have to get much better at making good arguments in a much faster way. They have to be good arguments. And my dad would never have believed this, but I've become, sadly he's gone, but I've become a fan of the Pope. And I mean, not religiously, it's, uh, but he is a remarkable communicator. You know, he said, you know, God always forgives, people sometimes forgive, nature never forgives. You know, if we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. Now, I have problems with bits of that. You know, I find creation a bit puzzling. But that's not, that's not the point, because the argument that's offered is basically right, and it's put in a very uh, persuasive, crisp way where people understand the point. And, you know, we sometimes take half an hour to clear our throat. Maybe I did tonight. 
It's the, we have to get much, much better at that. So in this post-truth era, don't give up rational argument. Just get much better at communicating it. And that's a real, a real challenge because the arguments that we tend to put are arguments that construct it. They do have a basis. You bring in the evidence. It takes time. So when we do these fast arguments, they've got to be well-founded. That's going to be part of the skill. So uh, I worry about that. I've testified a couple of times to US Congress. I found that my accent was a crippling defect. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm asked again, I'll do it again, but I'm not sure I will be. The, um, the high cost of capital, particularly in India, I mean, it's one of the points that Prime Minister Modi was making during the, uh, to Barack Obama, during Paris, that look, you know, we pay eight or nine percent real in India for these infrastructure projects. You know, for many places, the cost of capital is, is practically zero. How do we bridge that gap? Well, I tried in the course of what I said to describe how you bridge that gap. One way you do it is through much more reliable policies and building um, policies and institutions around those policies that give some confidence. I think feed-in tariffs, for example, are a very good example. Of, uh, of policies which carry some confidence uh, with them. Um, or in the UK, contracts for difference is, an, is another thing which Ed and his team put together when he was in office. Um, the, you do that on the policy side with the right institutional structures. And on the supply side of the finance, you structure the finance. I won't repeat it, but in the ways I've tried to describe it earlier in, uh, in this talk. If you bring down the real cost of capital from 8 or 9% to 3%, you not only make lots more infrastructure possible, you change the quality because a lot of the renewable stuff has, is capital up front because you're avoiding the running costs down the track. So it's not only that you liberate more infrastructure this way, you also change its nature and in, in, the, in the right direction. Population growth. Well, basically, we are about bit more than 7 billion and will probably a bit, be a bit more than 9 billion in the middle of the century. Um, most of that has to do with um, increasing life expectancy and the number of women in childbearing age. What we're seeing around the world is a very rapid reduction in fertility in terms of, say, number of children per woman. Uh, it's crashed down in very different countries, uh, Iran, Bangladesh, uh, India, many, many parts of the world. So those fertility rates are going right down. Uh, by the way, I should note that if you're thinking about um, population growing less fast, I assume you're not talking about increasing death rates because that's always one uh, option you could pursue. Like f free, free cigarettes for the over 60s. But the, so let's, 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 just focus, let's just focus on birth rates. Yeah? So I, I've tried to describe how it is that those population estimates come to be what they are. Uh, uh, in a context of falling fertility rates, nevertheless increasing life, life expectancy and um, the number of women in childbearing age. If you ask how fertility rates come down, we know a bit about that. Uh, they come down because infant mortality rates come down. They come down with education of girls and women, and indeed education of men. They come down with greater opportunities for women in the workforce. They come down with greater opportunities for women in ownership, inheritance, and, uh, and so on. Uh, these are all, and of course, access to reproductive health care. So these are all things that seem to me to be drivers of the fall in fertility rate. And they're all things that are terribly important, basically in the point of view of, uh, of human rights. So I think the argument for pursuing along all those fronts, you know, opportunities in the workforce, reducing infant mortality rates, access to reproductive health care, all those arguments are very powerful and uh, in their own right. Now, you can add a bit of a climate argument to it if you want, but it seems to me they're already so powerful that if you're talking about reducing uh, fertility rates, uh, I would go those routes uh, rather than some coercive uh, route, which in my experience and in the Indian experience uh, is extremely, can be extremely counterproductive. 
Okay, well, I think we have time for two more questions. So um, I'll take one from the uh, lady just beside you. Hi, thanks very much for that interesting talk. I'm Olivia and I do economic policy masters at UCL. Um, How many people here from the LSE? <laughs> bet it, you're very welcome. Um, so following on from stranded assets and um, kind of uh, powerful bodies who have huge vested interests in kind of not going in with the energy revolution per se. Um, what would you recommend for incentivizing um, both pri private and public interests, especially, for example, the OPEC states whose economies are completely based on oil or oil companies who still have their fingers very much on the button for governments? Thank you, Thanks. and I'll go over to the, the gentleman just in front of you there. Yes, for the last question. Hope it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's an issue that hasn't come up so much. I'm Paul from the International Institute for Environment and Development. In the um, NDCs, a lot of the least developed countries talked a lot about mitigation. Do you think that makes economic sense? Thank you. So, incentivizing change in people who are committed, in a sense, to in terms of their activities and their ownership structures uh, around fossil fuels. Um, I think the kind of policies we've been talking about are the kind of policies that um, are relevant. Uh, in other words, prices of carbon, regulation, innovation, discovery of uh, alternative ways of doing things, building cities that uh, work. And um, that will rad radically reduce, this is the point, the demand for fossil fuels. I mean, in a market economy, if you want the demand to go down, then the price that consumers pay, whether it's explicit or implicit, should go up. If you want the supply to go down, then the supply price, the price that people get for the commodity, in this case, a fossil fuel, should go down. So you want consumer prices, and this is London School of Economics, right? You, you, want, you want the prices in, on the demand side to go up, and you want prices on the supply side to go down. And what's the difference? It's policy. Yeah? It's a tax or a price or a regulation. And that's what you need to happen. And uh, as those policies kick in and get stronger, then the profitability of producing will, will go down. But it seems to be very important from the policy point of view and from the ethical point of view to look at demand and supply. Yeah? The demanders demand, I mean, most people, all of you uh, use fossil fuels, right? I mean, you fly airplanes, you ride on diesel buses, and I hope you use a bit less as time goes by. You use a lot less as time goes by. But what we want is through the process of consumer demand, through the process of incentive structures people face, the profitability of that sector to go right down, ultimately to zero. Yeah? And that's the way in which it will uh, change and diminish. And I think to be fair to a lot of the countries which live off fossil fuels, they really are anticipating that change. I mean, a lot of Gulf countries are investing very strongly <coughs> in, uh, in renewables and so on. So I think implementing the changes, going after the, what's involved in the Sustainable Development Goals in Paris, finding this new, much more attractive way of doing things, those consequences are there. And so they're embedded in the whole story that we're, we're trying to uh, tell. The poor, very poor countries and mitigation. One of the, very, and I should say I'm a great admirer of the uh, IAED. Um, I think that uh, what's remarkable about so much of the discussion and the Paris Agreement itself is everybody wanted to do it. They wanted to do the right thing. Yeah? Um, now, of course, there's different pressure on different people, and the poorer you are, the less, th the less pressure there is. Um, and that's right. But the, basically, you're charting a way to a much better way of doing things. And it is remarkable and encouraging, actually, and something we should celebrate, that the poorest countries, many of the poorest countries, where it be, you know, bunk, Bangladesh or the small island states or whatever, they really want to go this route, partly because they see it as a much more attractive way to develop, 
but partly because they see, particularly they understand the threats they face and the consequences of climate change, and they want to be part of the answer. And that's a good part. That's a good part of the world. That's something, it's a good aspect of the world and something we should celebrate, whilst at the same time working to make that transition uh, for the least developed countries as attractive and easy and supported and technological change, finance and so on as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for tonight. It remains for me to give thanks, firstly, to you for being a wonderful audience, and secondly, to Nick for being a wonderful lecturer. Thank you. Thank you.